Hi, Pete Stevens from Mythic Beasts Limited. So, V6 only hosting part two. Part one was at Manchester. If you haven't seen that, and some of this doesn't make any sense, go back and watch it, but hopefully it should be straightforward. So, previously at UK North, we have virtual machines and some dedicated servers. They only have IPv6 connectivity. There's no v4 address. They use NAT64 to get out to access v4 only resources. And we've got a centralized proxy server where you can drop in the URL, the, the domain name you're dealing with, and your backend v6 address. And it sets up a proxy that proxies HTTP and anything that uses SSL. People say, what about things that don't use SSL? I say, turn on SSL. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the last talk had a, a description of basically what we went through to get all of our management features to work. So every single thing that we offer as a managed service works on a v6 only backend server. And as a result, we can now sell you a managed service that does not need any v4 connectivity whatsoever and is available on the internet. Why bother? So the first reason to bother is at some point we're going to run out of v4 addresses and this gives us a way out without having to get into a bidding war with everybody else's v4 addresses. You can reduce your CG NAT costs. For us, that doesn't actually make much difference because we have NAF all outbound, so we don't really care. Um, the bit we didn't realize when we started this is um, single stack makes your configuration easier. We only have to configure one firewall, not two. Um, and the other thing is having globally routable addresses everywhere is really handy because if you want to join up a private network in one building with a private network in the other building, you can use SSL and talk to each other and let the routers work out where the packets go rather than building internal routers and internal firewalls to match together pieces of private address space. So dual stack itself actually isn't a lot of fun. Single stack is much, much nicer and we can't quite like it. Question is, is this any actually any use for a real person that's ever tried to deploy a real application? So, start with the basic tools. LAMP stack, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. They're all fine, they all work. All the bugs have been fixed, pretty much it's okay. Uh, other scripting languages, Python, Perl. Perl needs socket six installing, but once you've done that, it's okay. Nginx, another web server of choice, that works. So does Postgres a whole bunch of open source tools that people build applications on and they're all fine running in a v6 only environment. So that's a promising start. So our first application, WordPress. Many people don't like WordPress. It's a big pile of PHP um, written by people who were occasionally possibly not quite as clean about their code as they could do. Um, and it runs about a quarter of the internet. Um, so from the Obviously, websites are the only thing on the internet. The other protocols don't exist. But yeah, so WordPress is about a quarter of all websites. So if we can sell WordPress IPv6 only, we've got a product. We can expand the company for quite a long time, and that will, that will go. So we started with raspberrypi.org back in 2012, and their backhand network sits v6 only on basically a prototype of the stack we built for commercial people. Um, the WordPress core works absolutely fine. WordPress has, I think, 50,000 plugins, something like that haven't done a complete survey to work out if they all work or not. Some of the plugins might not work with IPv6. To be fair, they might not work quick enough to be usable in your website, or they might just not work. Um, all of those things happen. Our experience is actually we've only got one that we've definitively found really doesn't work with IPv6. There's quite a lot that don't work quick enough, and there's an awful lot that don't work at all. So IPv6 isn't the problem here. It's just people write terrible software. So the one we found that really doesn't work is login lockdown, and that's because what it does is it locks people out who try and brute force passwords. So it knows about IP addresses, well, IPv4 addresses anyway. And it has a really neat feature, which is if a single IPv4 address gets blocked, it blocks every v6 address. So nobody can log in over IPv6, um, which is security in a slightly over-aggressive way. Um, so we did the only sensible thing you can do at this point, which is we forked it. And uh, we sat down with a cup of coffee and about 20 lines of code and uh, fixed it. So now it supports IPv6 and it locks out slash 64s when it sees too many bad logins coming through. And that gets deployed as part of our standard WordPress stack and everything is happy and it's all nice and it works. So that's all good. Um, there's lots of other plugins for WordPress. The most exciting one is probably WooCommerce. People turn on online shops. That works, multiple shops functioning. Uh, Gravity Forms, I've not really used it, but it's something to do with like making online forms work easier. Supercache, 
if you want your WordPress site to stand up if more than 10 people look at it, you will need to install that. We recommend that. Um, search engine optimization, that works. Um, Akismet is uh, spam filtering for your comments, which again, you really need, and that calls out and works fine over the NAT64 layer, even though Akismet don't support IPv6, and I keep asking them and they keep not doing it, but we'll get there. But basically our experience is pretty much every well-used plugin under WordPress works fine. You can take a WordPress site, deploy it on a v6 only host, and it'll work. Which is good, because we offer WordPress as a managed service and people keep buying it. And basically, we apply exactly the same rules we always used to do, which is if you want an extra IP address, you have to write a technical justification to explain why you need it. But now we're proper computer scientists and we count from zero. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so far, we've had exactly no valid technical justifications for WordPress. Um, so all of our managed WordPress instances are working v6 only, which is, which is good. So we've achieved something. We've got a product that we can sell that people like and they actually pay for that doesn't consume any v4 addresses, which gives us a way out of running out of v4. So one part of our stack that I didn't mention in my previous talk is uh, we use fail to ban, which does exactly the same thing as login lockdown for WordPress but for SSH, and it doesn't currently have v6 support in any of the stable packaged installs. But that's okay, because someone else wrote SSH Black, which does exactly the same thing, and you can just swap the package that you use and use a different piece of software. Problem solved. Um, MediaWiki uh, runs a moderately famous website called uh, uh, Wikimedia, Wikipedia. Um, so far, we've only ever done this as single server installs. We've not tried breaking it apart to build a big cluster. But basically, it works. Um, it has a visual editor plugin that's built on top of Node.js, which talks internally over v6. Um, and that all works, and the only actual public one we've got is wiki.uknoff.org.uk, which some of you may have looked at at some point today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the platform supports SSL. Let's Encrypt turned up. We like S Let's Encrypt a lot. Um, free SSL certificates, so we don't have to bother asking customers if they're going to pay for them. We don't have to invoice them. We don't have to get purchase orders. We don't have to do admin, uh, we don't have to validate them via email addresses through the domain contacts because it just uses the web server. It all automatically renews so we don't have to keep getting things renewed. And it's going to take away those irritating times that you get on Christmas Eve where someone says, my SSL certificate has just expired, please can you update it and you need to find someone who can sign off the order. Um, Let's Encrypt is great and it also works completely v6 only. You don't even need the, the 6.4 proxy, sorry, 4.6 proxy. Um, which, which is good. Um, RPF.io. Um, this is a URL shortener for Raspberry Pi. Um, and uh, they used to use Bitly, but they decided they wanted to use their own short domain. Um, and uh, basically, it's a glorified HD access file. You say, take the short URL, redirect to a big URL. So we mailed Bitly and said, we can't find the option to use our own domain name. And they replied with a quote. And this is what we said. Hi, Joseph. Can you confirm the price is $695 a month? Did you miss a decimal point? $6.95 would make more sense. Yeah, that didn't go very well. Um, so we took an open source piece of software called Yours, installed it on a V6 only VM, and hey presto, we've got a URL forwarding service. Um, if you think PHP is rubbish, like Nat Morris does, um, you could write your own in Python and do uknoff.uk on exactly the same platform. Works fine. Etherpad. Um, this is a Google Docs-like word sharing um, thing, written in Node.js. Um, inbound, everything works fine. The only problem outbound is um, Node pulls everything in from the Node package manager. And Node.js wrote their own implementation of Happy Eyeballs, and it's really good. So it does a quad A lookup and gets a quad A record through the NAT64 proxy. And then it does an A record lockup, and it gets an IPv4 address that it can't read to. And then it doesn't connect to the IPv4 one and stops which is really good. Um, there's actually a really trivial workaround, which is you just drop the quad A record in your host file, and then it doesn't do the A record lookup, and everything works fine. So it's a little workaround. It's not that bad. We can live with it. Indico, conference booking system. Um, again, I can't remember what this is. It might be Python. Some open source tools that worked sufficiently well that I can't remember what they are. Adds in Redis and Memcached as a caching layer, because obviously one caching layer is not enough. Why use one when you can use two? And it runs indico.uknoff.org.uk. So if you are at this conference, you have successfully used an IPv6 only website. Well done, everyone. Sugar CRM. Um, open source CRM platform. It's now gone closed source. 
Um, it relies on Apache 2, Elasticsearch, Memcast, MySQL. Um, we needed to build a split site setup with a primary and a secondary in different physical data centers. Um, we need to build a separate instance for every single client that our customer is using, and they're planning to have thousands of clients, which means we're going to consume thousands and thousands of addresses. We need to get routing between them, which means we're going to use thousands of public v4 addresses, unless you build it completely v6 only, which is what we did. Um, we built it with Linux containers. You run a little install script, up comes a container, brings up a v6 address, all the internal parts talk over IPv6. It uses SSL to communicate between the two halves. So we don't have a private network between them, it just uses SSL using real addresses. There's firewalls that restrict you so that you only talk to the other half of your cluster. Um, and it's all very nice and straightforward and works great. We've got hundreds of customers sat on it. Um, the prototype they used that they showed us and said this is the sort of thing we want to build was built with Docker, which uses overlay networking, which means every machine gets a slash 24 of private address space and they run a UDP protocol between them all to forward their internal addresses from one machine to another and firewalling that so that the thing that's come up on a random IP address somewhere in your infrastructure can only talk to the other half and not any of the other customers and you can't intercept each other's memcached and so on is a real nightmare. And we're glad we didn't do that and we replaced it. So that was good. Hadoop. This is where it doesn't go so well. Hadoop doesn't work v6 only. But it is better than it used to be. It used to not work if you had a v6 address. A link local v6 address was enough to make it not work. Um, so it used to be the Hadoop installer literally said, delete the IPv6 module from your Linux machine, reboot without IPv6, now you can run Hadoop. Um, so yeah, that just completely doesn't work. Um, if someone would like to fix Hadoop, yes please, please tell me when it's done, we'd love to test it and run it in a v6 only environment, but as of yet, that's still merrily in v4 land, which is a bit annoying. We're wondering if we can tunnel v4 over v6 in order that we can run Hadoop on v6 machines and let it talk v4 amongst itself, but it kind of breaks its internal model of how the network is constructed, and that's a big painful project we've not really tried. So Christmas, we sent UK off for Christmas card, and we gave them an award, which was the second best IPv6 rollout we'd done this year, because the UK off web infrastructure that runs this conference is all sat on v6 only machines with us, and we used one IPv4 address in the whole thing for the mail server because we couldn't hide mail entirely behind various proxies and things. And we did wonder about it, but we reckoned someone in this room would have a mail server that would break and they would get very angry with us when their email couldn't be received. So, um, so yeah, second place. Well done. Better luck next year. Um, so how about running a massive shared web hosting application? Um, Joshua Bayfield is 16 and he runs gwiddle.co.uk, which gives free websites to people in full-time education. Um, they came to us and said, will you sponsor us? And we said, yeah, sure, have some VMs. You're not having any V4 addresses. Um, and so he's managed to persuade about 1,000 people to do this. So he's got about 1,000 school-age kids who are already working in a V6-only environment. They're your future employees. Um, they're going to be quite surprised if you say your network doesn't have V6. And uh, isn't this and that stuff great? <laughs> so um, this is a slide I'm recycling. Computers are getting cheaper. That computer still costs $5, but the IP address is now 20, and it used to be 10. So that's four computers for the price of one IP address. So um, if you want to build a big platform with very, very cheap computers, like that one, which is um, a lot of Raspberry Pis in a rack, um, your IP address cost is going to be a problem. So we've got a prototype of this. Um, four U of rack space gets us 108 Raspberry Pi 3s, um, four cores each, each got a gig of RAM. Um, they're all netboot and use power over ethernet, um, just one wire to each Pi, and they use a couple of watts. So you can rock out well over a thousand physical machines in a single rack quite trivially. Um, we've got a little bit of private address space so they can get to the netboot server, and we thought, we've got a brilliant idea. We'll give a tagged VLAN with a public v4 address and a public v6 address for each Raspberry Pi so that they can get to the real internet, which is a brilliant idea apart from the minor problem that it doesn't work. And the reason for that is the boot ROM on the Raspberry Pi is economy, shall we say. Um, and if it sees a tagged packet on a tagged VLAN, it falls over. Um, so basically, it has to, each Raspberry Pi has to sit on its own private VLAN. And if you're going to do this properly, which is an educational platform, you should. We need to give them a slash 30 of V4 space so they can have V4 connectivity, which is $80 of IPs on a $35 computer, which is completely stupid. Um, so we could give them slash 31s, but we want to teach them properly. Or we could do 
proxy ARP, but that's horrid. Or we could just say, sod it, we're not supporting v4. So uh, if you buy a Raspberry Pi from a small hosted platform, you get a slash 64 or v6 base, and that's it. And if you want v4, tough. Um, but we've got quite a lot of these in production already. They, they sit behind our proxy service and our NAT64 service. People run real websites on them. Stuff is actually happening. Um, so that's the kind of fun project we've had to teach people how to do this stuff right in future. And uh, that's basically my talk. So we have a blog that you can follow, which contains this talk more slowly over the course of about 12 months. Um, we say rubbish on Twitter from time to time. And uh, we have Raspberry Pi 3s in the data, data center that are V6 only and waiting for people to buy them. Any questions? Oh, panel. That's true. Sorry. Sorry, yes. We're just deferring the questions to the, uh, the actual panel. Thanks, Bill.